Welcome everyone to SmallSat Virtual 2020. We all wish we were in Logan, Utah, um, enjoying Aggie ice cream and raspberry smoothies and uh, going for hikes and seeing everyone at the White Isle and stuff like that. But um, being online with each other and um, talking about each other's missions and latest results is almost as good and we'll, we'll make it up next year. Um, so um, welcome to Advanced Concepts 1 from the workshop. My name is Carrie Cahoy. I'm part of the Small Set Committee. And um, we're here today to hear a little bit of an overview from each of our panelists, our um, presenters, where we have the um, on-demand content available, and to allow for some questions and answers. Um, please make sure when you're asking the questions that they're diplomatic and polite and respectful <laughs> to make sure we get to those. Um, and use the little bubble Q&A feature down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So there is the typical chat. You can ask things in the chat and I'll take a look at that. But um, we'll try to get through the Q&A questions and that's where we'll look first. Um, and it allows you also to um, have that um, addressed um, by, by our panelists. So I'm really pleased today to have such a wonderful moderator who will be um, introducing each of our panelists and um, managing all of the questions and discussion. So Dr. Alex Howard. So Dr. Alex Howard is the Director of Space Systems and Technologies at Raytheon BBN Technologies in Cambridge, Massachusetts, focusing on low TRL capabilities and advanced technology. Um, he was previously with the Air Force Research Lab Space Vehicles Directorate as the mission lead for space control and as the chief scientist for the Eagle satellite mission. So thank you so much, Alex. I'm gonna turn it over to you um, and I'm here to help out if you need me. So have a great, great time, everyone. Great, thanks, Carrie. Well, hopefully everyone can hear me and uh, glad to be here. And like I, I can echo Carrie's sentiment, definitely missing the ice cream and smoothies and, and the general company and uh, camaraderie of really visiting people face to face. So. Definitely um, looking forward to a great session here and a lot of great questions. Please feel free again, the Q&A at the bottom or the chat as well. And, uh, you know, it, it, going through these different webinars uh, yesterday, today, so forth, uh, a lot of great conversations going on. And so I encourage folks to uh, participate. And I see, we still, I still see a lot of people coming in, um, which is great. So, you know, um, we'll go ahead and I'll go through and I'll introduce all the, the talks and speakers and um, and then we'll have each speaker spend about a minute or two uh, giving a, just a synopsis really of, of what their, their paper was. And if you haven't had the opportunity to go and look at the recorded presentation, I, I suggest that you, you do that. They're on the website, very easy, they're very nice to, to go back and reference as you need to. And um, so with that, you know, our, our first speaker uh, paper today is the radiation tolerance of low cost magnetometers for space applications. And we have Leonardo Regali. Uh, the second is the guidance navigation and control for agile sp small spacecraft with articulating solar arrays. And we have Rob Magner. And then on the third is the CubeSat electrical interface standardization for faster delivery and more mission success. Um, I don't know if Mengu Cho has yet made it on, but uh, you know uh, she was the primary there. And then we have uh, the fourth is the NASA Centers and Universities Collaborate in Annual Small Set Technology Partnerships. Uh, again, I, I haven't seen James pop up on the list here. Um, and then our fifth paper is a ground-based 1U CubeSat uh, robotic assembly demonstration with SNA Uzu Okuru. Uh, then we have sixth paper, thermal storage for high power small satellites with Michael Eisenson. And then seventh, a non Holman method for orbital element data pre database pre-processing with William Hudnett. And our last paper for the session will be qualification and flight of a cutting edge sun sensor for constellation applications with Johan Leitens. So with that, again, welcome everyone. And uh, I'll go ahead and start with uh, Leonardo. If you wanna give a brief uh, one, two minute synopsis and then we'll go from there. Uh yeah, uh, so uh, would it be fine if I share my screen with my presentation and go quickly over it? Yeah. Um, if you can. No, oh, okay. There, okay, there you go. Yep. Okay. Um, so, yeah, this is a full presentation. I'm not going to go through all of it. But uh, what I'm presenting is a, a set of results that we had from a, a commercial official uh, magnetometer that we've been working with at the University of Michigan and the Johns Hopkins lab, uh, Applied Physics Lab. 
Um, so the, this is a magnetometer. It's a really small uh, three-axis magnetometer. Uh, it has a pretty good sensitivity, close to one nanotesla uh, at one hertz. Uh, and we've been characterizing this for space applications. And one of the last steps that was missing, so we published a paper with most of the results already in 2018. And one of the results that was missing was the radiation tolerance. So we went ahead and uh, I'm, I, this is the functioning of the magnetometer. You can see it on the full presentation online. Um, but yeah, one of the, what we did is uh, we basically went to two different facilities, one at Michigan and one at Goddard Space Flight Center. And uh, we did this study in the framework of a Europa Lander mission. Um, the science definition team for the Europa Lander asked for a tolerance of 300 K rad. So it's a 150 K rad for a 20 day mission. And then they have a, a factor of two for, for tolerance. So they ask uh, any instrument to, to withstand uh, 300 K rad. And this is a pretty, if you're not familiar, this is a pretty high uh, level, level of radiation, especially for 20 day mission. Uh, a typical uh, LEO uh, for a couple of years, it might be around 100 K rad. Uh, so yeah. So what we did is uh, we tested these uh, nine different magnetometers and these are the facilities. Uh, this is the accelerator, linear accelerator at Michigan. Um, this produces a set of uh, brem strahlum beam for nine MEVs. Uh, uh, the, rate, the rate is 9.6 K rad per minute. So we expose nine magnetometers, three of them in this facility and six of them in this other facility, which is, is, is at Goddard. Um, and we exposed all of them up to 300 K rad with different uh, combinations of active and passive tests. And what we found is that surprisingly, without any special shielding, and remember this is a COTS sensor, uh, se seven of the nine uh, uh, work perfectly fine until 300 K rad. We saw some degradation of signal in the, in the meantime, but nothing really strong. Two of them fail. And then when we tested all of them, and I'm gonna go to these results, uh, what you're seeing here is a pre-test on the left and after, after the test on the right. Uh, this is like taken a few weeks after the, the test. Um, the standard deviation we are taking as a signal of the noise of the, of the noise of the sensor on top of each uh, of the plots. And you can see if you compare left to right, there's actually no significant change. So after the sensors recover from the test, uh, we see like uh, eight of the nine, actually one of the ones that failed during the test recover. Uh, don't see, don't, don't, don't have any appreciable uh, uh, degradation of the signal. So yeah, in short, this is a, it seems to be a pretty cool technology. So if you're thinking of any, uh, any, concept that needs a magnetometer to fly, just let me know. And this could be a really cheap concept uh, for you to, to use. So yeah, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you. Great, thank you, Leonardo. Um, Great, thanks, Leonardo. Just, just a quick note, we, we really would, um, management would prefer that um, people keep the talks separate and um, just speak to the camera without um, share screening if possible. So just, just oh, okay, a quick good. note there, but, yeah. but thanks. And we'll let Alex go ahead with questions. Great. Uh, actually, uh, you, um, yeah, so let's go ahead and, you know, uh, so this, I'm looking at the question. Oops, technical difficulty. All right, so uh, I don't see any Q&A uh, questions popping up in there. And we had one question, I believe, come up beforehand. Um, and so let me go ahead and ask that. To, and that's actually from Johan Leitens. Uh, so Leonardo, why were the described radiation tests selected? And is there some more information available on the radiation energies? Uh, Bremsstrom uh, generally has a very wide energy. Oh, go ahead for answer that first one. Yeah. So, what, what was the first one about why, why we chose what? Right. Uh, yeah, as, as I understand it, that's right. Um, how, describe the radiation test that you selected, and then, you know, why the energies? Why, why how did you come to those radiation energies? So yeah, what we were we were interested in the total ionization dose basically. So we we chose the two facilities because those are the two of the uh, facilities that we had access to. Um, the, the, we actually tested uh, different rates so to make sure that you know in the silicon you can expect that uh, damages can happen differently if you have like a really slow rate or if you if you have like a really hard you know uh, amount of radiation accumulated over time so we actually tested for both cases and we didn't see any difference there so what we wanted to get is to the tid of, of 300 k rad which is what uh, the nasa is asking for a poss possible europe europe lander so in terms of the more details about the test and everything uh we have a uh, a paper already under review 
Uh, the good thing is that the, the, we submitted to a, an EGU journal that has like an open review process. So if anyone's interested, they, uh, just send me an email and I can send you a link to the paper. You can already see it, even though it's in, in the, under review. Uh, and if you have further questions, just write me an email. Yeah, I'd be happy to answer. Great, thank you. I would be happy to receive the paper. <laughs> okay, yeah, uh, just write me an email and I, I will send it to you, yeah. Great, and, and I think the follow on to that then uh, is then that, you know, the Bremster lung generally has a very wide energy range, which makes correlation to other more common radiation tests difficult, right? It, it's sometimes impossible, really. Uh, a radioactive material um, is also not specific. So why isn't the regular cobalt specified or why is a different radioactive material used? Why, you know, what would, how'd you come around to your source? Is it just availability of the sources or was there a specific reason you chose this? Yeah, that's actually a good question. And the second test, uh, I cannot give enough details about the Goddard setup, uh, basically because I don't have the details. So th this is a pretty close facility. They don't, even though I was there for the test, they don't give you enough details about the sources and everything. But this is a radioactive source. I think it's cobalt or some cobalt 60 or something. So uh, the, the uh, sources are definitely different. So again, because we're interested in the TI, in the total ionization dose, what we did is we, uh, for both tests, we placed a, a dosimeter right next to the magnetometers while, while they were being irradiated. So uh, we wanted to make sure that we got to the right dose. And, and yeah, you're right, like the, the beam is gonna be widespread and, and it's not like very narrow, uh, but at least we, we, we were sure that we got the right radiation dose at, at the sensors. Great, thank you. All right, so in the interest of time, um, we'll, I'm gonna go ahead and move to the next paper, and then we'll, if uh, at the end, we'll come back uh, and okay. spread it out again. So uh, the Thanks. second paper then, uh, you bet. thank you, Leonardo, very much. Uh, we have Rob Magner uh, for the guidance, navigation, and control for agile small spacecraft and articulating solar arrays. All right, uh, so Rob, can you give us a synopsis and go for All right. it? Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, so quick syn synopsis, uh, basically, uh, in order to enable higher power generation for some of our upcoming missions, SFL uh, is employing a new platform where we move our, our main power generation onto articulating appendages from the more conventional, simple, small sat design where you have solar cells just mounted to your single bus and then um, your attitude that, say, has you point a payload at a ground fixed target um, is going to not be optimized for power generation. Uh, then with this, uh, these articulating appendages, then we can kind of concurrently optimize those two objectives of pointing our solar arrays at the sun while also pointing our payload wherever it needs to point. Um, and so basically my, my paper is just about the uh, GNC considerations for this new technology. So trying to ensure that we're still able to perform our agile uh, attitude maneuvers uh, specifically for um, most of our missions. Those are kind of ground target tracking from low earth orbit type maneuvers um, while concurrently um, having optimal power generation using uh, these articulating arrays. Um, yeah. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so I, we had one question again ahead of time, um, again, Johan. Uh, so the question I believe is, uh, instead of adding an encoder, Rob, uh, to measure the solar array attitude, uh, wouldn't it or couldn't it be easier to simply add a two-axis sun sensor to the arrays to directly measure that sun pointing and measure then the, I guess, cosine loss? Uh, yeah, sun tracker then determines it. That's, that's a good point. You could uh, definitely do that. Another thing that we considered was not even adding an additional sun sensor, but just using the solar array currents as a kind of core sun sensor. So, you know, when current's high coming, coming into your battery, that means that you're probably pointing at the sun. Uh, basically, the, the trade-off there is just accuracy. Um, with, a, with a modern encoder, you can, you can uh, measure that rotation very accurately. Uh, and with a sun sensor, uh, yeah, sure, you would be able to get a high level of accuracy, but then you're adding another device, some more mass and, and structural considerations to accommodate it. Um, so yeah, the, the encoder was just from a systems level, the, 
the best move for our, our design. Great. And then I, a second question, uh, Rob, that I had, and I didn't see any other questions pop up, but one I had was, uh, so you noticed, or you presented that there was a 0 0.07 degree hit using the algorithms to the accuracy. Was that a steady, or was that the average loss, or was there a, a, um, a latency involved or a fluctuation of that accuracy? So was, you know, I guess, were uh, the higher and lower bounds of that? Yeah, good question. So I, I would say overall, um, no, it wasn't. It wasn't added um, across all all operations. Uh, that would be so. It's zero point seven degrees two sigma. So essentially, it means like at the out, we have more outlying cases that push up the the overall value at the the two sigma uh, level, um, and so that would basically be caused by our higher. Um, or a more agile kind of fast rate tracking maneuvers where the error is increasing a little bit. Um, but then down at the, the lower rates and lower accelerations, it's virtually the same. Um, and yeah, I guess that would be my answer to that. That's great. And then, you know, I, and then uh, a, question, a question came in here, uh, Dennis, just, and so, and it leads to me the third question is, uh, you, this was for a low Earth orbit mission set and analyses. Would these be useful for deeper space missions or other orbital parameters? Um, for example, if you did a cislunar or even interplanetary, uh, you know, something along those lines. Uh, in this case, he asked specifically beyond Jupiter, or at least reduce the total area of panels needed at the distance. Um, yeah, for sure. I think some version of this technology could be uh, extended to other cases. Um, if anything, I think that maybe the the problem becomes a bit simpler. Like if you're on a a solar orbit, then uh, the the sun relative to your attitude is going to stay fairly fixed for a lot of your mission. I think um, because in in low Earth orbit, like we're 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 tracking these ground fixed targets, and so where the sun is pointed relative to us is is changing quite rapidly. But I think if you're on a trajectory towards Jupiter, um, the problem might be simpler. Um, but yeah, it would certainly be interesting to look into. Great, thank you. And, and, and similarly, we'll move to the next speaker here and then we'll come back, um, Rob, here in a bit at the end. Uh, and, and actually, so for the third paper with um, a CubeSat electrical interface standardization, uh, did, did we have a, an author or representative for that paper? I didn't see anybody in the list here. Okay, so um, I encourage everyone, uh, look at that paper, if there's any questions, contact uh, Mingyu Cho, uh, corresponding author, and, and ask questions there, and we can, uh, we can uh, you know, or if you need any help with that, talk to any of the, the staff or committee and help route those questions. So uh, did, Again, the fourth paper. So the NASA Centers and Universities Collaboration paper from James Cockrell. Did we have a representative come on for that one as well? Hi, Alex. This is Jim Cockrell. I, I dialed in oh, by phone. Can you hear my voice? We can. I, yeah, I can Jim. hear great. We're glad to hear you. Yay. Excellent. <laughs> I wasn't great. able to get in by Zoom, so I hope you can hear me okay by the phone. Excellent. Yes. No, I, you're coming loud and clear, so that's awesome. So, Jim, go ahead and if you, yeah, give us a synopsis of the paper presented and uh, we'll go from there. I'd be glad to. Um, it's nice to see everybody virtually by uh, as the virtual conference um, takes place. The, my name is Jim Cockrell and I'm the chief technologist for the Small Spacecraft Technology Program. And my paper presents the nine small SAT technology partnerships that were awarded for the 2020 year. Uh, these partnerships are, um, they are two year technology development efforts that are between universities and a NASA center to develop technologies that are relevant for small spacecraft. We try to award these roughly every year, although um, sometimes we skip a year. The 2020 year, um, we awarded small set technology partnerships for technologies that were relevant for lunar exploration with small spacecraft. Um, the, um, the technology topics that we selected this year were for lunar communications and navigation network compatible with the proposed LunaNet architecture, 
um, small set propulsion for lunar missions, and the third topic was advanced electrical power subsystems or thermal management technology for small spacecraft, particularly in cislunar space. And we awarded nine partnerships this year that was very competitive as it has been in the previous years. We had many, many more uh, proposals than we were able to award uh, due to budget constraints. We were able to award five partnerships for um, communications technologies, two partnerships for propulsion technologies, and one for a thermal management technology. And um, if I don't have time to, uh, obviously, to describe each one of these technologies and the partners, they're very interesting and um, they're really doing some in-depth and uh, highly uh, cutting edge kinds of research and their partnerships. So I encourage everyone to go to the paper and read more detail about each of these technology partnerships. And I don't know if I have time to just mention the names of the universities and a list uh, in the remaining seconds that I have available. Do I have time? Please do. Absolutely, Jim. Go ahead, so, please. Sure. The partners this year are for flat panel phased array antennas with two simultaneous stereo, steerable beams. We have San Diego State University in partnership with Glenn Research Center. For a 3D printed hybrid propulsion solution, uh, we have Utah State University in partnership with Marshall Space Flight Center. The third is a high precision continuous time PNT compact module for small spacecraft. That's between University of California, Los Angeles, and JPL. The fourth is variable specific impulse electrospray thruster uh, between University of California, Irvine, and JPL. Next, we have an additively manufactured deployable radiator with oscillating heat pipes, which is a partnership between California State University, Los Angeles, and JPL. Sixth is deployable optical receiver aperture for lunar communications. Arizona State University and JPL. Seventh is an on-orbit demonstration of a surface feature-based navigation and timing mechanism, which is University of Texas at Austin in partnership with JSC. The last communications partnership is a small satellite lunar communications and navigation system in partnership between University of Colorado at Boulder and JPL. And then we have another propulsion technology, which is lunar missions enabled by chemical Electrospray propulsion. This is a hybrid propulsion system in partnership between University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign and Glenn Research Center and Goddard Space Flight Center. Those are the nine partnerships that I described in much more detail on the paper. Excellent. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate that. It's a very good synopsis of the work there. And um, I don't care, did you have a question for Jim or follow on to that one? So I'm always excited to hear about um, how you guys evolve your topics to align with NASA's needs and then pretty expertly um, pick the um, collaborators that can bring some new ideas into the mix. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that evolution and how it, how it comes to you guys and moves from there? Yeah, that's a great question, um, Carrie. What we do is we try to find technologies that are relevant to missions that are of, um, you know, that are in the near term of NASA that NASA is interested in doing. That would be for for both for human exploration and or for science missions. Uh, and um, these technology development partnerships are relatively low TRL. They have to come in at TRL three. So we're looking at a horizon of. You know, the, the partnerships last for two years, so we expect the technologies to get maybe to TRL-6 and maybe be infused in a NASA or a commercial mission, uh, you know, in the out years, three, four year horizon. Um, initially, when we started these technology partnerships, they, we began in 2013, and the focus then was just in developing subsystems. So we had communication subsystem propulsion, the usual things. Um, but we were more interested in the subsystem development. In the next year, we were looking at more like systems-oriented kind of technologies. In 2016 and 2018, we were thinking about swarms of spacecraft and things that allow spacecraft to communicate cross, uh, cross links in orbit as well as down links and um, instruments that could be um, deployed on an array of small spacecraft, you know, sparse aperture antennas and that kind of thing. 
Um, this year, we were looking at lunar exploration, where you know, since NASA is pivoting to the moon and beyond, we wanted to see what kind of technologies could be developed that would be relevant for lunar precursor missions, um, in-situ resource uh, investigations, uh, lunar communications that would form infrastructure at the moon. Um, and so uh, we're interested in technologies that were deployable in cislunar space. So that's sort of the evolution of the years. And the way we arrive at these technology focuses, foci, are, um, I talked to the, uh, the technology, um, the principal technologist in the Space Technology Mission Directorate. I also talked to the folks in the Science Mission Directorate and in the Human Exploration Mission Directorate, um, get their inputs about the kinds of missions that are of interest in the, you know, that four or five year horizon uh, and get their input as to the kinds of technologies they think are the, the most relevant gaps that are upcoming. So we're always looking out to where we think small spacecraft should be in the, um, in the short term and how they're useful for future NASA missions, as well as for commercial applications. That, that's awesome. Thank you, Jim. And well, I guess one last question um, kind of uh, dovetails on Carrie's question was, uh, are there international collaborations or opportunities for uh, you know, international researchers and partners and, and opportunities in that realm? Because of, you know, NASA funding constraints, we are constrained to just funding U.S.-based universities in partnership with the NASA Center. Um, of course, there are international, uh, international efforts at developing small spacecraft technologies, but the domain in which we're working is we award, um, they're, um, they're a type of grant that we call a cooperative agreement. Uh, and the principal investigator has to be from a US-based university. Great, thank you. And then I think we'll, we'll save the other questions. Uh, we'll come back around and uh, move to the next speaker, and if that's okay. Um, sure, thanks. With, with, thank you, Jim. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Esme Uzo Okuru uh, in the paper entitled Ground Based 1U CubeSat Robotic Assembly Demonstration. Uh, Esme? Thank you, Alex. So, um, we, uh, I'm Esme Uzo Okuru from um, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, my fellow authors and I looked at on-orbit robotic assembly missions and realized that they typically involve humans in the loop and use large custom robot arms designed to service existing modules. So our concept of on-orbit robotic assembly um, is one that uses modularized CubeSat components um, <clears throat> with use cases such as uh, re rapidly replacing field nodes within a constellation of satellites or monitoring uh, damaged assets in low Earth orbit. So our work um, in our paper describes the potential and approach to um, on-orbit robotic assembly of small satellites using low-cost robot arms. So we show the feasibility of a robotic assembly of a 1U CubeSat and we optimize for our robot assembly time. We um, demonstrate this lab prototype, um, laboratory prototype assembly of a 1U CubeSat. We analyze the systems engineering process um, of what it would take to um, ensure that um, this robotic assembly is feasible. And we use a um, what we call a spacecraft locker. So uh, think of an orbit agnostic locker that can be deployed on demand in multiple um, locations that has uh, robot arms within them and components within them. The, the locker is about a mini fridge sized uh, spacecraft with propulsion capability and it will include in addition to robot arms and spacecraft components, sensors and propulsion modules uh, for a 1U to 3U CubeSat satellite that will enable multiple CubeSat configurations that can, as I mentioned, uh, respond to rapid evolving space needs. So our summary, uh, what we did um, discover is that um, we could indeed demonstrate uh, robotic assembly with no humans in the loop, um, optimize, um, optimizing integration time for CubeSat assembly 
in under uh, 10 minutes for a 1U CubeSat, which is a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter. And also um, assessing you know, various modular configurations, payloads and propulsion options. We look forward to moving to an ISS um, technology demonstration in the future and space qualifying the system to show that it can you know, operate in a space environment. Thank you, Esme. That, yeah, it's pretty fascinating. So, as I understand it, you focused on the 1U, but what, what do you believe it would take to expand to 2U, 3U, XU? And then what, uh, you know, and then how would that affect then your, the storage locker and the logistics aspect of that? Um, I think that we wanted to first uh, be able to prove that this uh, was feasible and then um, tested in a thermal vacuum chamber and ensure that it could be space qualified. Once we can show that, really, I think um, we can grow um, as long as, because we do have the technology, we do have modular systems that we can, that can be used for uh, a two U spacecraft, a three U spacecraft. We would have to expand the size of the locker and our power considerations will increase increase our thermal considerations will obviously increase but um, we do see um, the need for that given that most of the um, most of the form factors that tend to be useful in our um, sector are usually between three to six u as you know well, that's great it's really fascinating and and here's a question that came in from uh, david zuniga uh, question is, uh, is there any value in, do you believe, in having a hybrid robotic assembly and a human assembly? Oh, I'm sure there is. So we, one reason we um, embarked on this is because we see um, the commod commoditization of spacecraft given this recent proliferation of um, space, but how do we provide um, what's needed for all the constellations that need to be put up. There, there is a, a great need and very few companies that have the capability to provide um, uh, spacecraft in large quantities. And we um, still tend to build a spacecraft as one-offs, which is not uh, particularly efficient. So why not really commoditize the spacecraft and show that we can do robotic assembly even here on the ground. Our cars are built by humans, you know, they're assembled by robots and they are checked and probably uh, qualified by humans. And so why not conduct robotic assembly of spacecraft here on the ground? Why not use um, the human and, um, and robotic hybrid here on the ground and then move to doing it in space where you have, um, where you have robots uh, doing it primarily. You, know, you could have astronauts um, inspect the work um, at the International Space Station if, if you choose, but we need that capability here. So humans are definitely um, a required step as we incrementally move to a complete robotic assembly. It is amazing. I think you're exactly right. So I guess that leads to the question of how long does it take to assemble one? So right now, this one U CubeSat, which is a, um, a modular piece and that's 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter, takes uh, seven minutes and 34 seconds for two um, low cost robot arms that are uh, purchased off of Amazon. So these are really low cost to assemble this in a lab prototype. However, um, the real, the, the real exciting piece is when we move this into a vacuum chamber and show that uh, with space qualified parts, with um, a space qualified robots, space qualified stepper motors, um, we are able to um, assemble these, uh, these CubeSats at the, same, um, at the same time frame, then I think that it would really, um, it would be really exciting for us to, to build to build spacecraft that quickly um, and, and focus on payloads, focus on the scientific um, instruments rather than the commoditized piece that we are all familiar with. Uh, yes, <laughs> that's exactly right. Great, Esme, thank you. And uh, we'll circle back around for some more questions here at the end. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so with that, um, I'll move to uh, the sixth paper, is the thermal storage for high power satellites. Uh, and that's Michael Eisenson is the, uh, 
the speaker there. I don't know, Michael, are you on? Here we go. Ah, Thanks, Alex. Um, really uh, excited to be here. This is the first year I've been uh, participating in the Small SAT Conference, so it's memorable for all sorts of reasons. So, um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Eisenson. I'm from Criari LLC. And uh, the paper that I submitted is called Thermal Storage for Small Satellites. This talks about a feasibility study that uh, we completed for JPL last year. And uh, the goal was to develop uh, thermal storage technology that can help higher power small satellites maintain stable component temperatures in challenging environments. Um, and, and the overall goal of the thermal storage is to enable uh, satellites to continue to use passive uh, thermal control approaches, uh, things like heat pipes and loop heat pipes, without needing actively pumped systems to, to move heat around from heat sources to heat rejection, but stick with these passive systems, but also accommodate uh, you know, variable thermal environments or the, uh, the external radiation environment can change from, from in the sun to eclipse and so forth, uh, and, and also accommodate uh, highly variable thermal loads uh, depending upon the mission and maintain uh, much more stable temperatures than you can typically achieve with these components. Um, we, uh, the, the project had two main components. One was a, a feasibility analysis study. We uh, formulated a simple model for a small satellite in low Earth orbit and analyzed response to um, uh, various environments and uh, uh, load profiles and different types of thermal storage material and uh, basically showed that uh, uh, the, the thermal storage materials can maintain um, uh, stable, more stable temperatures than, than a system without uh, thermal storage using loop heat pipes and heat pipes and those kind of passive systems. And the second part was a uh, proof of concept demonstration of the hardware. We built a, a small thermal storage unit. It was sized for a heat load on the order of 100 watts. And uh, we showed in a series of tests using a, a heat pipe uh, to simulate a, a satellite thermal control system that uh, the thermal storage unit was coupled closely enough to the, uh, the load to maintain stable temperatures through some step transients in power. So uh, please take a look at the paper. There's a lot more detail in there. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Uh, yeah, a question that just came in uh, from Boris Yendler. Uh, the question is, is wondering why you used the uh, LHP instead of a standard heat pipe for the study? Well, uh, we chose a loop heat pipe as the basis because as the satellite powers get larger, uh, up in the 100 watt type range, uh, you um, basically need things like deployable radiators to handle the heat loads. And to transfer that heat from the, the satellite bus out to the radiator surface, you need, you need some way of transporting the heat that can accommodate that just mechanical linkage that you need uh, to, to deploy the radiator. And loop heat pipes are uh, much more suitable to that kind of a system than a conventional heat pipe because they can have flexible elements in them for the uh, the transmit for the transport of the liquid and vapor. Regular heat pipes are typically very rigid and, and wouldn't be able to accommodate that very well. So would you would the loop heat pipes are they scalable then across the different various sizes of uh, small satellites, CubeSats and so forth? Um, they probably don't scale that well down to the smallest size, but once you get up in the 50, 100 watt plus range, things like ride share ESPASAT type um, uh, uh, spacecraft, uh, then loop heat pipes have been built, uh, you know, with, with the appropriate uh, 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 power heat transfer uh, uh, capability that they handle those kind of spacecraft. Great. Thank you very much, Michael. I appreciate that. Okay. Very interesting paper. Okay. And similarly, we're going to circle back around here and uh, we'll uh, give more questions here in a moment. All right. Uh, the next paper is the uh, number seventh, uh, the seventh paper is the non Hohmann method for orbital element database pre processing with William, William Hudnett is the author. And so, William, if uh, you'd like to give a brief synopsis. I see, I see him on, but I don't know if there's any technical difficulty there. Muted by the host, potentially. Oh, he's, 
Huh? We can hear you now, I think, or no? No, I heard Johan. <laughs> yeah, we heard it's Johan. Um, we're not muting you as far as we know. Um, it doesn't mm -hmm. look muted. Maybe we'll circle back. We'll do one more and then come back and see if he's ready. Great. So, um, uh, William, we'll come back to you uh, to figure out um, what, what's causing the, the problem there. So, um, we, dial in with a, um, if you have a cell phone, you could try to dial in with that and come back and see if that works. Just keep your other one muted or off. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, then we'll move to the eighth in, in paper is in the session was the qualification and flight testing of the cutting edge sun sensor for constellation applications. And we have Johan Leitens on online here to uh, give that brief uh, synopsis. So, Johan. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, glad to be here as well. Uh, would rather have been in Utah, but uh, that's just the way it is. <laughs> um, so, Lens R&D, we started uh, back in 2012. I uh, spent um, 11 years at a research institute called TNO, developing uh, uh, a lot of new technology for small satellites. And we realized that uh, there will be more satellites uh, and all of them will need uh, uh, more reliable equipment. So we started to develop uh, our own sun sensors, which are optimized for volume production, uh, which means we have developed our own wire bonding, uh, wire bondable housing integrated connectors. We use fully automated wire bonding. Of, uh, we use vision based uh, diode placement. Uh, that's the first automated step and fully automated wire bonding. And we developed a specific uh, robot to do the last uh, stages of assembly. Uh, the components we use are uh, sapphire, which is very radiation tolerant. And we have a special radiation hardened photodiode. So that leads to uh, sensors that can be produced in volume, but uh, have reliabilities that are good enough for uh, NASA class A and uh, ESA class M missions, uh, let's say. So we've taken a lot of time to uh, get a full qualification, uh, but we're nearing the end of, uh, of uh, the tunnel, uh, let's say. And uh, um, uh, now recently, we uh, also used the same sapphire membrane and photodiode to make the first radiation hardened CubeSat sun sensor based on a nano D connector. So we don't use a wire bonded uh, connector, but we use a nano D connector. Slightly less reliable, but then again, you have a much lower profile, so you can put them on a CubeSat uh, easily. And people want to take CubeSats to asteroids, to the moon, to Mars, to uh, anywhere, and they need radiation tolerance. So we have our own photodiodes. We recently qualified a new batch to more than nine and a half megawatts. Uh, so for the time being, that should be enough for most uh, satellites, I think. And um, Yes, for the future, we hope to uh, develop a, uh, a small digital sun sensor, a true digital sun sensor. Uh, but we're currently working on an ESA project to make that uh, really radiation hardened as well, because there are so many sun sensors uh, for low Earth orbit uh, that can stand uh, half a year or uh, two or three years in orbit. There are very few sensors that can stand uh, 18 years in geo orbit after electric orbit tracing. And that's the target that we have from ESA to make a single chip digital sun sensor that can stand 18 years in geo after electric orbit tracing. So then you can also take it to Mars or anywhere else. That's the, not only the paper, but also a bit of the future that we have in hold, let's say. Thanks, Johan. So I, I guess the immediate question would be is, to, so you talked about the qualification and can you briefly talk about the process that you've undergone for those qualifications and is it specific to ESA, to NASA or against, the, there's a qualification against an ISO standard, for example? Uh, so we, uh, we, we did a very lengthy process because we started off with aluminum uh, sensors with a peak insert and they were minus 40 plus 80 degrees. And we went to a full ESA uh, standard process. So the ECSS uh, E1003 is a very well-known standard called testing. Um, and then by the time we got qualified, uh, one of our major uh, suppliers dropped out and we had to revise the entire assembly scheme. So we had to devise the uh, automatic assembly robot. At that time, there were a lot of people asking for some sensors you could put on the solar panel directly on the solar panel, hence my question earlier. Uh, so uh, we developed a sun sensor that can go from minus 125 to plus 125 degrees C. So you can put it directly on an extendable solar panel 
again for geostationary applications. Uh, but that meant we had to go to a very lengthy qualification process with uh, a lot of thermal vacuum cycles over a very wide temperature range. And that generally takes time. So uh, we've done the entire qualification at least twice. Uh, we had some setbacks in the meantime, so we had to do it uh, almost three times uh, in total. But uh, uh, as I said, we are, we are there now. And uh, uh, we are still adhering to the ESA uh, 1003 uh, standard. Uh, and and um, well, we've done all kinds of strange tests, uh, 36,000 thermal cycles, minus 80 plus 85, for instance, just one of the tests uh, to name. Uh, and uh, as I said, we initially tested up to 10 to the 16 1 MeV electrons until we found out that's something like 240 megawatts. So for the next batch, we stopped at uh, 3.9 times 10 to the 14th 1 MeV electrons, which is both total dose and uh, displacement damage, but uh, enough to su survive uh, any low Earth orbit mission. Again, if you use electric orbit raising and stay 18 years in geo, you'll have to go a bit higher. But uh, we'll sure we'll manage that. But for the time being, our first goal is to get a full qualification and the ESA stamp and some nice ESA and uh, NASA contracts, uh, let's say. So uh, we have one of the very few um, uh, high reliability sun sensor manufacturers. So uh, there are only very few uh, in the world left uh, that really make uh, NASA level or ESA level sun sensors. And we are one of the few. But we're a newcomer, so uh, it's been difficult. It sounds then, very, very our, first, our, our first sensors, our first set six uh, should have been on e cells, should have launched on uh, the 4th of uh, August, but it's delayed until the 14th. So uh, unfortunately, uh, but we have uh, plenty of them flying because all the satellites from SSTL in the UK will fly our sun sensors. Uh, this is uh, the e cell satellite from OHB Lux Space in uh, Luxembourg. All their new Triton platforms will fly our sun sensors. And so we're getting on board of multiple platforms. So in the future, well, you'll find more and more of our sensors. But a lot of people wait until the qualification is uh, complete or almost complete before they design in the sensor. So it takes a long time before you're uh, accepted, let's say. Uh, but we're getting there. Definitely a process, an acceptance process, right? Uh, great. Thank you, Johan. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, um, I would like to mention that in the chat, Carrie has posted a link to the papers uh, for folks that have been looking for the different papers. Uh, so just scroll up and you'll find the, uh, the URL there and or just go to the web the home page of the small stat website and go to keynotes and talks and follow the link from there. So uh, point that out. So at, at this uh, did William, um, were we successful in uh, Hello, is this working better? Can you hear me now? Okay, Excellent. good. I had Great. to remote into my phone, but perfect. I'm glad right, that yeah. I can now actually present. So I and my co-author Cameron worked on this as part of Professor Kurt Anderson's obsolete space cast capture and retrieval program at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And our particular project, this thing that uh, Ochi have submitted, sorry, is a, an algorithm which is capable of reducing the size of an orbital element database in preparation for use as a target set for a multi capture debris remediation satellite. Um, <clears throat> Our objective was to uh, make it take as little computing resources as possible and to be able to process large databases of any format, primarily looking at two line element formats, but in general, any theoretical format that could be used to contain orbital element data, and then to be able to produce a usable data file on exit from the program to uh, using a more efficient trajectory generation optimizer so that the multi-capture satellite could actually reach all three or four of its proposed targets. Great. Thank you, Ron. So, uh, you know, I noticed uh, reading the paper, I think one of the um, 
data points was that it reduced the data set down to 100 different targets within three seconds on a laptop. And can you provide some a little more fidelity for 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 us on the, what's the context? Does it allow you know minimization of delta v to conserve lifetime, or does it say, hey, if I did a plane change, I could accomplish x three retrievals in the lifetime of the of the object? So the objective of the satellite is to be able to capture four pieces of debris at which point it deorbits all of those pieces of debris using an electromagnetic tether system and deorbits itself along with the final piece of debris. <clears throat> so the uh, system is designed to work with a fixed maximum delta V constraint, which is user provided and then produce a list of debris that is accessible within that delta V constraint. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, it's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, no, I appreciate that. It looks like very interesting work. And, um, so, at this point, I believe we've gone through, and I, I don't know, um, I did want to provide the opportunity for Mengu Cho um, or any of the corresponding authors for the CubeSat electrical interface standardization paper. Um, did anyone show up? All right. Uh, I see Johan's actually raising his hand. Uh, Johan, did you have a, a yeah, question? Yeah, I realized, no, I, not a question. I realized I forgot to answer one, one, of, uh, one important part of your question. Uh, the difference between NASA SEN uh, uh, qualification and ESA qualification. They're basically the same, but the NASA requires another thermal cycle before you do vibration to mimic on ground uh, thermal balancing testing, the, the failures that you can get there. So we added that test on top of the standard ECSS uh, 1003. So now ESA doesn't normally do that test, but NASA does that test. That's the only disc uh, discrepancy in the test sequences between ESA and NASA. I just want to talk. Thank you, Johan. Appreciate that. Definitely. Great. Uh, I didn't see anything from um, the, the Japanese paper. Uh, so I, again, I encourage folks to uh, watch the presentation for the ISO. Uh, and I believe there's a sidebar meeting set up during the small stack conference here for that as well. So uh, any questions, please, please reach out to Mengu and uh, correspond with those. So, um, all right, so at, at this point we've gone through and I know we've got about seven minutes remaining in the session until I would like to open it up for questions uh, and re-engage with any of the, the authors that are here. So um, I'm looking at the Q&A and we've answered some of the questions that have come up and in the chat as well. Uh, so otherwise, if, yeah. No questions. I've got plenty that I can uh, start asking. Okay. Well, I guess a, a great question I have is then um, if I want to go back to um, to, to Jim. Um, Jim, if, with uh, your uh, opportunity, do you think that there's um, a swarm of nest technologies will come into play into your decisions for uh, the future uh, future opportunities and collaborations and partnerships as you know. Um, the a lot of news surrounding the SDA and the you know blackjack and DARPA blackjack and other uh, proliferated swarms of satellites. So uh, I don't know if them um, wanted to touch on that. <laughs> I was on mute. Um, so the question is about swarms and um, technologies that are suitable for swarms, small spacecraft swarms. Is that was the question? That's right. Yes. Yeah. So um, we have focused on swarms in the past. We were interested in the way that disaggregated um, spacecraft can work as an ensemble to accomplish a mission together. Um, and so we have awarded um, in the previous years uh, technology um, development uh, efforts that were aimed at, um, I mentioned cross-linking, but also relative navigation, uh, navigation between spacecraft for precision formation flying, um, instrumentation that's suitable for um, dis distribution across a swarm of small spacecraft, 
And um, uh, we believe it, it, it's expected that um, small spacecraft working together can accomplish things that a large monolithic spacecraft can't do uh, in various ways, such as serving for um, things like inspection missions or repair missions or um, measuring distributed phenomena, changing phenomena in a distributed area, such as solar physics, where you're looking at the heliophysics, uh, where there's a, you need to take measurements in a, in a distributed way simultaneously. Same thing for exploring a, uh, a, a terrestrial, a, um, sorry, a planetary body. If you want to understand how Martian weather works, you need to take simultaneous measurements at more than one location so that you can see a system of Martian weather. Um, so in the past, we've been interested in um, technologies that were useful for controlling swarms and um, helping spacecraft operate in the form of a swarm. I expect that in the future, we're going to be looking at things like um, spacecraft working autonomously together, um, dividing a task between spacecraft in, a semi in an autonomous or semi-autonomous way so that you reduce the amount of manual intervention. You don't have to operate each spacecraft uh, separately manually. So we have been looking at um, technologies that will enable swarms, and we expect to do that in the future as well. Awesome. Th thank you, Jim. I appreciate that. So uh, I, with four minutes left, I've got one question, and I, and I believe that any one of the speakers here could answer this, because I think it cross cuts uh, across all of them, really, is uh, in so with three minutes, it's going to have to be a quick answer. Um, what, what, what do you think that the maximum power of these CubeSats or small sats will be, and what would they be using in the future, right? As you imagine a scenario where you might have uh, a satellite built in seven and a half minutes that Esme presented, and you know you're looking at the power optimization, the uh, uh, you know the GNC stuff with Robert, and the radiation tolerance for interplanetary or so forth. So it, I'll ask the whole panel there. What 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 do you think? Where do you think that's going with these uh, technologies? Well, I'm a big fan of big batteries and as much power as you can pack into them. I don't know about the high density batteries that are out there, but I think I think that's that's the direction we'd want to go in. Anybody recommend high density battery technology out there as a low TRL or even higher TRL? Esme, how do you put the batteries together? Right now, uh, it will be a compact power system, and um, we will modularize it by um, ensuring that it is snapped together um, into an adapter-like feature so that it gives uh, power through a flexi-cord uh, to all the subsystems. You could just like snap on a few extra if you wanted to increase the power, and then, then right. you're back to how big and massive you want to be. That's right. Works for me. <laughs> Definitely appreciate that. So uh, with that, Carrie, I don't see any other questions. I know we're coming short on time. So, uh, Carrie, what, how do you? So, um, yeah, and normally we just thank everybody so, so much, um, panelists and participants. Um, before the chat completely disappears, if you want to look there, you'll see the link to the online proceedings papers. It's in the menu on the small set page that Marianne, can, Marianne confirmed is, is there. Um, and happy to follow up with contact information that people have in their papers on any questions. Thank you again, Alex, for doing an awesome job moderating. Um, I think we get to work together again later, so that's good. <laughs> and a warm round of applause to all of our panelists. Thank you so much for your time. Um, you can hear me clapping. If you want to take mute off, you can all clap. <laughs> Otherwise, have a wonderful rest of your meeting, and um, hopefully we'll run into each other again in one of these, and next year in person. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Hey, all. Bye. Bye.